So I just want to uh, welcome you to this presentation uh, by Lindy Klein and Chris Mubin uh, from the Australian College of Nursing on stories from the help desk. And um, just want to thank you both for your time and uh, looking forward to hearing this presentation. Over to you. Thanks, Shane. Um, thanks very much for having us. It's it's always a pleasure to present at IMOOT. It's such a friendly community. And as Dot's pointed out, it, it can be quite an exclusive group, but quite a fun group to join in with. Um, so let's get this presentation rolling. It might be nicer if we share a camera or two and just say hello. Can do. I'm just switching on the camera now. So hello. Today I actually have a decent internet connection so I can share a video. <laughs> Um, I'm Lindy. The, the guy on the right is Chris. I'm trying to uh, get my web camera going. And officially our titles at Australian College of Nursing are Instructional Designer and Systems Administrator respectively. Um, anyone who knows me knows I also used to work with Pukanui, so I've got a fair bit of Moodle background. Um, this may explain some of what happens later in this presentation. So for those who aren't familiar with the role title and, and what these roles are, instructional designers are this. Um, we proof course materials. We do a lot of reading. Um, we do a lot of activity building. We try and make sure that course content matches up to uh, intended learning outcomes in a way that the student can flow nicely through the subject and actually get the full benefit from studying it. And over to you, Chris. And uh, as a systems administrator at ACN, uh, again, uh, implementing the information technology systems um, goes from, from servers to desktop applications, uh, looking to the ongoing improvement of those systems. Um, so that in, I guess, relation to, to Moodle and uh, what we'll be talking about today is just uh, with the, the ticketing system and the help desk and working out better ways of approaching that and providing training for users uh, interacting with uh, our, our help, desk system, help desk systems and, uh, and desktop systems. So um, these roles don't specifically relate to Moodle support. They just don't. Um, they're preventative mainly. So if I'm doing a good job as an ID, a student should be able to find their way fairly intuitively through the course materials. Um, if similarly, if Chris is doing a good job as a systems administrator, the system should just work and be available for the users to get in and do what they need to do. But, you know, this is real life. So tag, we're it. Uh, Chris got started, had never seen Moodle before and found himself very quickly put on the frontline help desk role. Um, I got started as an instructional designer and kind of got shanghaied into, hey, you know about this Moodle stuff? And thus was born a Moodle support desk. I should say we also um, along the way have had two colleagues. Facilitator support is kind of an ID role, Shane, or at least it is the way we interpret it here. Um, our educators are supported by our instructional designers in how to get the most out of the online learning environment. But our instructional designers don't have specific Moodle backgrounds either. One of them has worked with Moodle quite well in a previous uh, job position. The other really hadn't had much Moodle experience before they started here. So that facilitator support is more in um, how do you design a generic type of activity rather than how do you get these Moodle settings to work the way you want them? Or at least that's how we interpret it. Um, we also have a couple of colleagues who help us with support desks. So my manager uh, provides some of that second and third level more technical support. Um, a colleague that was working with us and sadly left was providing some of that frontline help desk support. And of course, we've got reception and uh, student services who often take first calls, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, I got asked this more when I was a consultant, does Moodle need support? 
I'm kind of interested. That we've got a couple of people in the room who, who can probably give a really good answer to this. So if you're about, jump in the chat. In your experience, does Moodle need support? Um, certainly in our experience, yes, it needs a lot of support. Um, more accurately, the students using it need a lot of support. They're often not that technologically confident. So they need a little bit of confidence boosting as they go along. Would you agree with that, Chris? Definitely. It's like, uh, it's that, oh, you, know, you can lead a horse to water, but you, you can't make a drink. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or install Word. Um, <laughs> so, Providing effective support then. Okay, so Dot, that, that kind of touches on what we're saying there is if your workforce or if your student base is more technologically confident, then they're probably not going to have so much of a problem with Moodle. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you're not finding it as challenging for providing support. <laughs> um, Sorry, I'm just reading the question from Shane. Maybe it needs support as it currently stands, but leads on to the question, should Moodle, should Moodle require support for students? Should that be a goal for Moodle? Um, I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment, actually, because part of what helped us was an upgrade. So we're looking at providing effective support. Um, the kind of core tenets of this, define what you support and what you don't. Um, Chris, maybe you can comment on that. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, that would be for, for a systems administrator such as myself. Um, it, it's the, the line between when support for our system becomes support for their, for their systems and we can't provide support for, for all students' configurations of, of systems that they run, which we then have to direct them to seek uh, tech support from uh, their, their private tech company. Um, what we do is, is up to the line is if there's a problem that they're having interacting with our system, we can try and resolve that. But if it turns out it's a, an issue on their end again, we, we tell them to seek, seek advice. Elsewhere. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that can be a bit challenging. Uh, timely support can be challenging if you don't have good structures in place. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. I do tend to harp on it, so um, it's not directed at anybody, but don't promise timeframes for work if you're not the one doing it. Don't promise timeframes for someone else's workflow. Um, unfortunately, I've had the experience here of some of my educator colleagues promising students that things would be fixed you know, by the end of today, by the end of the week. Um, they may have been completely unaware that I was actually on leave and couldn't look at any of it by the end of that day or the end of that week. <laughs> so yeah. do make sure that the person who's doing the work is the one who's promising how long it's going to take to get done. Um, uh, so on, on that, I'd like uh, just yeah. add that phrases like as, as soon as possible, um, phrases, you know, like if, if you follow the proper procedure, like it will expedite the, the time frame. like just uh, ne never give a defined, but do give a sense of it will Being be done. Responsive. As responsive yeah. and, and quick yeah yeah good call chris um informed support is making sure the people maintaining it know what the problem points are so if you've got a really big gap between the systems administrator who's looking after moodle and the help desk person who's answering the 200 odd calls about password reset then the system administrator isn't going to pick up that we need a better way to do password reset um in our particular circumstances, the person who could help facilitate the upgrade was the person answering some of those 200 odd password reset queries. So it quickly became a priority. <laughs> um, we also talk about human support. So you know, it, it's one thing to get a whole heap of emails or tickets coming in and a lot of queries about how do I do this or how do I get access to that, a lot of problems that you know, have technical solutions, but you've got to be able to look behind them and see the person who's having a problem and keep in mind that they are a human being. And, you know, in our case, I've had nurses on the phone at six o'clock at night who are, you know, going to start a shift in half an hour and have had bugger all sleep across the day. The 
you know, trying to fix this problem with Moodle is not their priority and it's really frustrating them that it's getting in the road of their priorities. It's stopping them from studying. It's a problem. Um, before you can even fix the technical, you've kind of got to deal with that frustration and angst over the problem being there in the first place. Um, Chris, did you want to comment on this one? Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess it's, it's also like looking at our support system. It's, uh, it can it can feel like a very very inhuman system at times. Like you know, they they, they call their details are taken down, they're passed on, they they're put in a process. Uh, a lot of people, especially nurses who work in such a human industry and uh, a contact based industry, they they want something a little bit more more tangible. Um, so trying to provide that in a sense uh, when when you're speaking to them first. Um, and, and allaying their fears and, and trying to add that human element to what, uh, for, for effective support, like what is really, it, it's a process and it's a system and it, it's not very human. Um, so yeah, trying to, to make sure you are that human element. Okay. Uh, so we talked a bit before about defining your limits. Um, we had some challenges with this when we first started out because you know, everybody wants to be helpful and everyone wants to make sure our students succeed and have the most positive experience possible. Um, I've had educators up here trying to talk a student through how to install Microsoft Word. But that's so far beyond, <laughs> so far beyond the two of you. Um, yeah, <laughs> eek, eek just about sums up how I responded actually, what are you doing? Um, so really th this kind of sums up how I try and reiterate that back to our staff. It's, it's not the job of the mechanic to make sure they've got a license to drive the car. It's not our job um, as educators, as help desk support, as instructional designers, as system administrators to make sure the end student knows how to drive their computer. It is our job to let them know what the minimum requirements are before they get into the course. So it's, it's not appropriate to, for them to find out um, halfway through trying to submit an assessment that they have to have it in a specific file format that they weren't made aware of before. So, um, there was a bit of resistance to this, not naming any names. <laughs> um, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps the, the help breakthrough point was um, kind of reinforcing if we can't provide that support for every student that we service, then we shouldn't be providing it for just one student because that's unfair and it's inequitable. To support people cannot provide that level of detailed support to roughly two and a half thousand active students at any given time. It doesn't work. Not at Thank all. Thank you. It doesn't work. <laughs> Something <laughs> breaks. <laughs> okay, so um, I've, I've touched on defining expectations. I'm sorry, Chris, I kind of jumped that slide. Did you have anything more to add on that one? Or would you like to take it away with this one? Oh, uh, just, just on the last one really quickly, I guess uh, if if a student does come in with with an issue, which often happens because they haven't read through the uh, the course requirements, um, they haven't read through the system requirements for, for the course, um, not just turning them away empty handed and being like, look, it's not our problem. Like. To, to an extent, I go, look, I can't fix this for you, but what you should do is uh, look for this. So like a, a lot of the times they don't have Word installed um, on their, they're trying to use uh, notes or, or pages or something. Um, and we just go, look, what you need is Word. Uh, and then I say, I, I can't tell you where to get that from, but I would recommend, you know, you, you contact someone or you go and price it from a few places to ensure that, you know, you get a good deal. Um, you know, try and tell them what they need to do within the scope of your of your limits to resolve their, their issues so they become compliant with the system requirements. That kind of segues nicely, Chris. <laughs> ah, excellent. So uh, yeah, we actually okay. make, no, that's okay. Uh, we make sure our students have the minimum system requirements uh, are available in the handbooks that outline all our courses. So even before they enrol, our minimum system requirements are really readily available. That doesn't mean they read them. 
it doesn't mean they know about them. It just means we've tried to make sure there's every possible opportunity for them to have known about them before they get into the course. Um, your system requirements may differ depending on what other systems you've got in place. So for example, it's, it's not a Moodle requirement that you submit files in Word but that makes our marking processes a lot easier. So it's one of our minimum system requirements. Um, if you want to check Moodle's minimum system requirements, the release notes will be up on moodle.org. Just check what version you're running and compare that in the release notes with what they state are the minimum client requirements. So quite specific. Okay, so we also needed to define the support roles and we've kind of already touched on this. Um, Chris, would you like to articulate more about who's responsible for first interactions? Yeah, You've cool. Been at that cold face for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was uh, this was an interesting thing we touched on. Like, uh, I hadn't really had much Moodle interaction before I started this job, and uh, second day on here, I'm answering students' questions relating to I I can't upload an assignment, I, and I'm. Yeah, um, so that was before we had the defined support roles and framework put in place for escalation and before we all really like, before I knew what I was doing with that. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, right now um, the, the system that we've got is uh, first point of contact takes down the details. Now hopefully by the information that we've gotten that we're, we're, we've given on the website for support. It should be either reception or the email for our, our support system. Uh, if they call reception, the receptionist takes down, you know, student name, course, student number, uh, just the, the things that make, you know, processing that request uh, and working out what's wrong uh, a lot quicker. Also a brief description of the problem. Um, I guess the problem there with uh, on the slide it says in the red, you know, they don't always necessarily contact the support staff or, or go through the support channels. Um, this is where sometimes problems can uh, can arise, and as Lynn, you were talking about before, uh, non-technical staff trying to provide technical solutions um, to to things, which again has <laughs> mostly been mostly been sorted out now, which is which is really great. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so again, hopefully using the, having a defined framework is, and everyone knowing what the framework is for, for passing on technical, technical questions, uh, it just makes the whole support process a, a lot smoother. Uh, and Shane, your comment there, making it clear to the students what are the appropriate channels has been really difficult. Um, ridiculously difficult actually, because our internal users keep redirecting them to the wrong points. So, you know, part of that um, learning and teaching relationship is the students directly contacting their coordinators or their tutors. If those people then redirect a student to the wrong support space, that delays the student, it causes frustration for everyone. It, it really has been quite a challenge getting that support flow in place, um, which is why the XKCD um, flowchart is in there, because it, it has. I'm sure for both support staff and coordinators and students, it's felt like a trap. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Chris has kind of touched on this already. Um, if we found the defining line was if it's trickier than a password reset, send it up. Um, and that became that kind of benchmark for the first couple of months while we were trying to get better support processes in place because that will that gave our reception staff some breathing space to acknowledge, no, I don't have to fix this. I'm not responsible for this, but I can put you on to someone who can help. Um, and I think um, a lot of our frontline staff were feeling quite overwhelmed by it, wondering if they were actually expected to, to fix all of these range of problems when they had no background in it. Is that a fair assessment, Chris? That would definitely be the case. Uh, I was bumbling around trying to work out why the settings weren't allowing someone to, you know, upload their assignment with no real idea what I was doing, no idea if I was making it better or worse, you know, like it was really a trial and error that I would work out what was happening, which wasn't an efficient or an effective way of providing support to the student there. Um, yeah. 
It's a bit horrible for everyone all around, really. Um, so we've, we've touched on where we've come from. I do really want to draw out from this slide the we had originally an email address that was accessed by several staff members. This is not a ticketing system. This is nowhere near a ticketing system. <laughs> if you're running with this system, please find a ticketing system. It will make your lives so much better. <laughs> um, we had no way of tracking how long. So I'm just looking at Dot's comment. We had our non-Moodle support desk people starting to tinker with Moodle code to fix a problem. Oh my goodness, that's that's horrifying. Um, <laughs> I, ouch, just please don't do that. That's not good for anybody. <laughs> um, we have had one of our uh, support people here request access to Moodle's backend databases so they could just fix something. Um, fortunately, the person they were asking for the access was me. And I went, you don't actually know how to write SQL queries, do you? Um, they looked at me blankly and I went, yes, no, you won't be getting that access. That's okay. Tell me what it is you're trying to fix and we'll work on it. Um, <laughs> you don't go playing in the raw back end of things unless you really know what you're doing. And unless you know you've got a backup somewhere very handy. Um, so yeah, that, that's not good. But, but getting back to kind of email address and ticketing systems, we laboured with a singular email address that every student, every uh, staff member could send a request to for probably eight or nine months after I'd got here. And I know it had been in place longer than that, Chris, I'm just kind of guesstimating it before uh, from, we finally got I access started. to a ticketing yeah. system. That, it's nuts. Don't do it. Um, yeah, just on what Absolutely, Shane. Shane. Day, yeah, yeah. Um, Shane's comment there is a whole audit trail issue too. If you go changing things in the back end, it, yeah, it could change things you need for other purposes. It could change contingent relationships. It's just not a good idea. Um, okay, moving on. We still have that 1 800 number that goes to reception and student support. And we still have from a student perspective, the same email address that we've always used. So the end users aren't seeing a difference, but that email address now pipes to our ticketing system, which picks up, okay, it's come from this email address, so it belongs to that category in the ticketing system, and these are the people who can work on that kind of ticket. Awesome. Um, I can feel, filter things out that don't belong within a Moodle category. I can bring in the ones that do. I can start tracking the things that our recurring issues and start planning, okay, how are we going to manage that so that we get a systematic solution rather than just patching it for every user? Yeah, definitely. Mm. I'd like to add with that with the, the ticketing system, having the ability to set category and subcategory and then, you know, being able to specify, you know, like what the issue is within that subcategory. So you again, start to collect your data. You start to, to get, again, what, what are the reoccurring issues? When are they most common? Um, so like for, for password resets, for example, much more common after the start of a semester than in the middle of a semester. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that, that kind of, you call them smells in code development, that kind of smell lets you know that there's a trend there that you maybe need to look at something else in your systems to prevent that issue coming up in the first place, which I'll come back to later on. Okay, so providing effective support is also about setting timely support and making sure you set expectations around what that is. If the um, expectations and reality get too far apart, you find there's a nice big pond of frustration between the two of them. Um, Chris, did you want to talk more on that? Yeah, definitely. Look, nine times out of 10, the expectation is that because you work in IT support, you know everything about anything relating to computers. So you will be able to magically wave your IT wand and fix everything. Um, snap your fingers and make it better. Do a bit of a, a Mary Poppins. Um, explaining I'll that that is- I'll just get my spoonful of sugar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, explaining that's not always the case and that there is a process and that there are there are other layers of and levels of support and that, you know, it, again, it could take time, but trying to reinforce it will be resolved as quickly as possible. Um, and in, in a very human way and in, in a very, 
you know, polite way, just, you know, realigning their expectations to fit more in with the reality of the, the timeframes with it that you have for a resolution of uh, support tickets within your framework. Um, yeah. Um, I think I'm, I just want to draw out a thread from that too. That everyone expects that IT can do anything with computers. It's unfortunate that the acronym IT and ID sound so similar because we often get people coming around to the instructional design area of the building going, oh, could you tell me what laptop would be best for my daughter to buy? I kid you not, I had that one last week. Um, that's, that's lovely that they believe that we've got that kind of expertise to help, but it's really not our scope of things. Um, so again, just reaffirming, actually, this is what I can help with. If you have a problem that fits these parameters, I'd love to help you. I was laughing um, at Shane's comment there. <laughs> <laughs> the pink one, Shane. <laughs> um, really? Chris, actually, you can talk more to this one because you were involved in setting this up. Excellent, yeah. Um, okay, so again, I touched on this earlier, the, the checklist for um, first contact. Uh, it's often more information than we actually need to resolve the issue. But what it means is that if we get everything on the checklist, that we don't have to look for anything. Like we, we have the student's uh, name, student number, course code, uh, course name, uh, a brief, uh, their, their email and contact phone number and a brief description of the problem. From that, we then should be able to either, like if it's a password reset, I can resolve that and then let the student know, uh, usually via email, uh, though sometimes again, we're working with nurses who work, you know, shift work. Sometimes you need to give them a call because they only have access to their email at certain times of the day and they've requested that they, they get a phone call because they want to access uh, their, their online learning while they're at work. You know, uh, they might be working a night shift, something like that. Um, so uh, I've, I've done that a few times. Um, but again, if I need to pass it up and escalate it, uh, all the information is there for the person who then is working on the escalation, which is most likely Lindy, uh, to be able to resolve that uh, without you know, digging and searching through databases to try and find the the rest of the information. Student management system, uh, don't laugh, we use FileMaker Pro. I'm always kind of surprised at how many students don't know their full course name <laughs> or their student number. Um, SMS texting, uh, it depends on the student. If they've, if they've given us a mobile number and we can yes we well i do um i don't know if that's actually a standardized thing if someone has asked for a text yeah i'm happy to text them and point them in the right direction if it can fit sensibly in a text oftentimes the students who are asking for a phone call are asking because they finally got fed up with trying to email it through they can't structure the query in a way that makes sense they just want to talk someone through it so um yeah, SMS texting, we don't have a lot of call for, but when students ask, I'm happy to. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've, I've never had to do it my myself. Um, and when they've given a phone number, I usually prefer to give the phone call just because I can get confirmation of resolution at the time. So I can pass mm -hmm. on, I can run them through if they, if usually it's password resets for me. So uh, I can run them through logging on because often it's not just password reset, it's issue actually logging on, having caps locks still on. That's that's a fun one. Um, yeah, so it just means that, yeah. <laughs> I, I know then and then that, there are, that their problem is resolved. Uh, yeah. Um, and you are very good at that uh, customer facing side of things too, Chris. I'm Thank a little you. less hands on with that. Um, so building on that then, Kind of some of the comments we've made here, you can get a sense that our audience is not always as tech savvy as maybe online learning would best benefit from. Um, this becomes even more challenging when we've got educators who want to get really creative with all the things that you can do in online learning and suddenly we've got no uh, similarity between different course offerings. So what works this way in this course is completely different over in that course and doesn't even exist over in this one. Um, 
over 18 months ago now, we started out to encourage our educators to standardise not everything, but some of the things that they do in their courses so that we could provide more effective support both to them and their students. And so that our students got a better overall learning experience because, you know, it just, from an instructional design perspective, it adds to student cognitive load unnecessarily to have a whole heap of clutter on your front page and no standardised way of getting through the things that you need to see. Um, and this is kind of course design 101. It, it's really basic stuff, but it's amazing how the basics can make or break you. Um, we're about to, with our next semester, trial a standardised course layout that features a lot of uh, improved navigational elements, standardised display of information in specific spaces, and we're really hoping that that has an impact on the student queries from those courses. Um, we've got a few educators who are experimenting with conditional access to activities at the moment, and that has caused quite a few support queries, but we still want to kind of encourage them to experiment and communicate more effectively with the students. The other side of this standardisation is we've got educators who do want to get creative. So they've all got their own sandpit course spaces where they can go and get creative, go nuts. You know, if you want to build an assignment that works in this particular way, or you want to build a quiz that has randomised questions and pulls this from that area and that from that area, go for it. Show me what it is that you want so that when we get it into your live course, the support people understand how it's supposed to work and how it does work and can provide you the support that you need and for your students as well. Um, Chris, I know I talked a lot on that one, but the standardised project has been more or less based up here. So did you yeah, want to add anything to, yeah, move on? Uh, only that I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, <laughs> when, when I first started here before, before Lindy arrived and talking with students on the phone and having to ask them to run me through where to find what was wrong because I, I couldn't find, I, each course was so different, designed so differently that I, I, again, I didn't know where to look for, they'd be like, oh, it was, it's a problem with assignment for the fact sheet. And I'm like, cool, where does that sit? Um, it's, yeah. That, that's an indicator that your courses aren't running quite as well as they could be. Moving on. So, and this is actually part of our systems feedback. Um, you know, having, if our students understood how to send us direct URLs, Aaron, that would help a lot. Um, some of them do. Some of our educators don't know how to do that. So we're, we're working with fairly challenging circumstances at times. Um, we do ask our reception staff to ask for the direct link if they can. If they can't get a direct link, can you send us a screenshot of what that page looks like? Can you send us the full screenshot? Because chances are the full screenshot has the URL. So <laughs> we can get it from that. Um, but yeah, it, exactly. If you can get the direct URL, you know exactly what you're looking at. So Definitely. we do ask, we don't always get it. Sometimes it's easier to get the name of the assignment and work it out from that because the name is something that the students can readily identify. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the time, uh, yeah, exactly. A lot of the time that the people that are uh, having these problems are the ones that, are, what's a URL? Uh, and you're like, that's the www dot, and they're like, where's that? Is that Google? Um, I've, I've had this conversation many, many times. Um, and trying to direct them, yeah. Uh, we nearly need a script for that conversation, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, um, and one of the things that actually came out of, because we presented a version of this session yesterday, one of the things that came out of that was um, other organisations having issues with their students trying to log into Moodle.org. So one of the ways we've kind of circumvented that right at the start of running our Moodle site is to call it not Moodle. Um, our main site is called Connect. Our secondary site for continuing professional development is called CPD. So we ask our students, are you on a green site or a blue site? And that way we know which site they're trying to log into and whether or not they should be on the other one. Um, but yeah, Shane, that, that's very much the dazed and confused um, 
ticket requests. <laughs> um, so this slide then is because Chris and I are both front facing on our help desk, we can kind of see what the issues are. I know for a lot of organisations that are significantly bigger usually. Ah, oh, that's awesome, Dot. I'm, I now want to put a frog on our front page. That's cool. <laughs> Can you see the frog? I just want that as a support question. <laughs> um, because we've been on the front desk, we see the things that come through, which means we can kind of adjust the system to stop those things coming through as much. Um, arguably, that can cause other issues, but, you know, that's part of the fun, isn't it? Um, mid last year, we went through a site upgrade from 2.5 to 2.7. Uh, that went actually reasonably smoothly, although I'll throw to Chris for any feedback on that, because I believe it went smoothly. Amazingly, actually. Like, I was a little bit nervous, and I was like, oh, God, I'm going to be, you know, dealing with lots and lots of really frustrated, upset students. But it went, went brilliant, yeah. I always like to double check. You know, I live in my own little bubble of Moodle. Um, <laughs> what we noticed was um, one of 2.7's best features. <laughs> Shane, <yes. laughs> Shane, you're doing that thing again. <laughs> I'm getting back on track here. Um, one of 2.7's best features was, at least for us, was the ability to log in with your email address as your username and to have one email for password reset. So we found prior to that, people weren't waiting for the second email on the password reset process, which made them really cranky. Um, we found that they couldn't remember their username, which also made them really cranky. Our usernames are student numbers, so it's not something that's necessarily meaningful to them. It's, it's only meaningful in our own ACM context outside of that, they're not going to use it all that much. So because they can log in with their personal email address, it's like, awesome, I've got this, I can remember it, not a problem. Um, from my perspective, that cut down a lot of student queries. What do you reckon, Chris? Yeah, definitely. Um, being able to, to more effectively reset passwords I, I'm, I'm lost for words at, at, at how much easier that has made my life. Uh, and and I the students' lives, you know, like that that's a reflection of that. Like if, if your students are happy and if your students are finding life easy, so will you. Uh, yeah. We're doing it right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't be entirely honest if I didn't also reflect there were some bugs along with that upgrade. So we use uh, the OU blog plugin and I overlooked that it needed upgrading at the same time as the site upgrade. And as a result of that, we spent about two days going, what do you mean something's wrong with the OU blog plugin? It looks fine to me. Yeah, it, it took me two days to work out the plugin needed upgrading so the students could see it. Always test it from your end user's perspective. I fail on my part. <laughs> Chris, do you want to talk to this one? Excellent. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is, uh, again, our, our, our receptionists are really good at it. And nine times out of 10, they're probably the ones that uh, that do that. Uh, I guess from, from my perspective, when uh, I have to speak to someone, it's because they're, uh, they're upset and the person on reception feels like it's important for them to speak to someone who, to the student, will you know, feel like they've got more of an authority to be like, yes, I can help you with your problem, even though I'm going to tell them exactly what they were told on reception. Um, often it just makes them feel more more relaxed, uh, more comfortable. Um, and it goes back to what we're talking at uh, before, which is just uh, working out, you know, what their expectation is. Often it's a fear. Um, often, you know, if they're having trouble uploading their assignment, it's uh Oh, oh, I've I've stuffed it up. I'm going to get zero for my assignment now. I don't know what to do. I'm I'm nervous. I'm I'm anxious. Like, uh, I I need this resolved now. Like, you know, and just be like the 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 way that that I approach that is to go. You know, I recognize your fear. Um, I I understand that you know you're you're anxious about about your assignment. Um, 
and then you try and reassure them. Like I, I say that uh, usually uh, your your problem has been logged, so we know that you're having a problem. Uh, I'll make sure I make a note of that. Uh, I will I will pass this up and escalate this, and we'll get a resolution for you as quickly as possible. Um, and yeah, again, that that's that's sticking to policy. Be like, look, I I have to I have to escalate this. Um, that we we have a support ticket system. We 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 have uh uh my my brain's gone blank. We we, we have a queue of, of people that uh, are getting support. Um, and you'll be put on that queue, and you'll you your problem will be seen to uh with as much speed as we can possibly possibly get to it. Um, so I guess I that goes too. to. Oh, sorry. Yep. Sorry, Chris. I, I think too. Um, you've touched on it there. I just want to reinforce it though. The if a student is worried that they're going to fail, I always reiterate to them: you won't fail as a result of yeah. a technical problem. Exactly. Right? If your work's rubbish, then they're going to fail. But reinforcing: look, you're not going to fail as a result of this technical issue. I've let your tutor know. I've let your coordinator know that you've experienced a technical issue, so you won't be compromised because of that. And yep. the relief that that brings is usually enough to get through the rest of the call. <laughs> yeah. Uh, often I'll also ask them, even if it's nine times out of ten not used or looked at at all, I'll ask them to email me uh, to support or, or to my email address a copy of their assignment. And I say, just so we've got a, a log of it, uh, they're doing something. They, they feel like they've submitted. They feel like they've done something. Um, not only that, but I guess uh, I don't know if it's actually ever been used. I've never followed that up. But... The, the course coordinator can then go back and check it against uh, the the final copy that they do get submitted um, because often people are calling up you know when their assignments due in an hour um, yeah <laughs> which which is which yeah. interesting no, none of us have ever done that as students ever no not at all <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I, I, I never called I, up with uh, with five minutes to spare when I was at uni what uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that innocent kind of walk. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did. I do know, Chris. That's been used at least once, where we've compared a student's upload with what was provided to the support queue. Um, Excellent. You know, it's not that we think our students would do a thing they probably shouldn't do, but it's nice to be able to confirm they haven't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the last point you have there is important uh, too. Yeah, so a couple of times, again, this is very, very rare, but a couple of times you get a, a caller who doesn't accept what you've told them, even if no matter how, how politely, how kindly, you know, no matter how patiently you speak to them, uh, they, it, it, you're trying to walk through it with them, they, they, they still won't respond positively. Um, and you can't know why, why that necessarily is, but I guess what you've got to look at then is, is this call now impacting my well-being? Am, am I getting upset? Am I getting anxious? And am I getting frustrated at this? Um, what's what's happening there? Uh, so one time that I can think of in particular, um, you know, the 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 person was making threats about you know complaints and going through, um, and it was a, a relatively simple issue that that could have been resolved, but there was uh, about 10 people in front of them that I was going through and working on. And I, uh, I guess, you know, I, I, I like the process that we've got. Um, so I was trying to get them to wait. They would have had to have waited less than half an hour for me to, to go through and get to theirs. But um, when they started being abusive, I was like, look, for me, I just want to get this over and done with so I don't have to talk to this person anymore. Um, so I, I resolved it as quickly as possible. I did it then, then and there on the phone um, and I made a note of it and I escalated it to my manager um, so that that student, I don't, I don't know what ended up happening with it, but I, I'm assuming they were, a note was made of them. Um, yeah. Yes, it was. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you've worked support long enough, you start picking out who the difficult people are to work with and you try and make sure you're especially um, equitable with them so that there's no further problems down the track that you've handled them appropriately. And this is where a ticketing system can really be such a time saver, such a life saver, because you can put in notes for the support staff, okay, this person has history. You know, 
treat them respectfully, but don't take any rubbish from them either. Um, I guess Chris tends to work on the student facing side of things a little more heavily than I do. I tend to work more on the staff facing side of things and that can be particularly challenging because if a student's calling, they're going to call a couple of times, but they're not actually in your workspace. Um, for managing the human side of things here, I've had to reiterate back to colleagues, actually, my role is this. The All the extra stuff that I do that helps support Moodle is not in my role. So the expectations you have of me to do this thing for you this minute are unrealistic. I'm happy to help you. These are the limits I have around it. And that has been extremely challenging. If anyone invents a magic bullet to deal with that, I will be the first one to buy it. <laughs> Absolutely, Shane. Um, and constantly because it, it doesn't stick. It, you know, Similar to our students, our staff can also get very stressed out over, okay, I have to have this thing ready by yesterday and you're the only one who can help me. Um, and often it is that situation that I am the only one who can help fix that particular technical thing that makes the rest of it work. So I try and be mindful of what problems have the biggest impact across the organisation as a whole and attend to them as quickly as possible so that everyone's stress levels are reduced as much as possible. It's not easy. Um, you good to move on, Chris? Uh, I am. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> We've already done uh. that. <laughs> um, so I, I guess this would be the Q&A period then because we've We've got quite a few stories from Help Desk and we've kind of shared some of them and hopefully some of the lessons we've learned along the way. Be kind to yourself, be kind to others as you work with them. Um, set your expectations nice and clearly so that everyone knows what's expected and how realistic that is. Make sure you do it in a timely fashion. Um, make sure your support is defined so that, again, your expectations aren't being stretched constantly. What would you add to that, Chris? Uh, I would say, yeah, everything that you've just touched on. Um, <laughs> and and from, from my perspective too, uh, it, it, it's great. The system that we've got means that I can trust escalation. Like a couple of times I was like, I don't know what happened with that, but I knew it was dealt with and resolved appropriately. Um, I didn't have to chase it up. I didn't feel the need to to go and be like, oh, you know, what, what, what happened with that? And, and that certainty, my assuredness, comes through in the way that, that, that I talk to the students and the, the confidence with which, you know, I, I speak to the students before we had this system set up and before Lindy came on board, uh, the language that I used was a lot different. Like I, I wouldn't use language like it would be resolved as soon as possible. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I would, I would say, uh, I'll pass this up and, and hopefully it will get resolved. Uh, you know, soon. I, I that my language was more hesitant because I didn't want to get students' hopes up. Um, now I'm I'm confident to say, look, you know, yeah, this will get done as soon as possible. Uh, thank you for your information. Like uh, providing that extra information means that we can uh, process this quest, this support request, uh, with a high level of expediency, and we'll get back to you when we have a resolution. Um, and then I'm happy to uh, you know flick that up to. Uh, Lindy or Lindy's manager, um, and you know I, I know that it's in very safe hands. And yeah, that trust between the members of the support team has made a huge difference because we don't have to go and double check each other's work, and that was happening initially. That you mm. know we were making sure our procedures are consistent, that we're giving the same kind of answers to the same kind of questions. These days, we know each other and our systems well enough to go. No, this is the way that works. Um, which is really fantastic. <laughs> so <good. laughs> grateful to have that. Yeah, I'm very grateful to be at that uh, point now. Um, we get to upset the Apple card again uh, with an upgrade to Moodle 2.8 or hopefully 2.9 uh, at the end of this year. Maybe even 2.10. Practical question: What sort of ratio? Ah, uh, we have about two and a half thousand active students at any given time. We have, um, the number of support staff is difficult to quantify. 
the number of dedicated staff in our ticketing system for Moodle queries is three at the moment. Um, but you've got to kind of sort of include our reception staff, which is two to three, um, our student services staff, which is three, and of course our educators that provide some of that support for students as well. So within our courses, uh, some of the biggest ones have about 100 odd students in them for uh, one coordinator and two to three tutors. Um, tutors are meant to have at maximum capacity a load of 30 students per subject. Some of them exceed that when they're really experienced or they're, they're really happy to. Um, but in terms of this level of support desk staff, yeah, there's three of us uh, and we're about to lose one of them. Which is terrifying. Uh, I, would, yeah, <laughs> I, I would touch on that and say that I, personally, I, I, you know, I guess I'm biased, but I don't think three is enough. Um, but again, it's as we touched on in the presentation yesterday, it's it's hard to convince management that the financial outlay is is worth it. Um, yeah, I, I would say definitely we we would benefit greatly from having a dedicated Moodle administrator and someone who could look look after all those all those uh, issues that arise. That's an ongoing conversation here and. Yeah. I know it's a challenge for a lot of a lot of those um, small to medium organisations because they're all kind of just under the size where you justify having that kind of stuff really easily. So a university easily justifies having a systems administrator for their learning system. It, it's almost a no-brainer. Um, in fact, they tend to have teams of them. But smaller uh, RTOs, uh, the college is... is very, runs very high quality courses, but we're in a very niche area. So it's a challenge finding the balance. And yes, Shane, I, <laughs> I knew, <laughs> I remember very clearly. Um, so yeah, we're hopeful that our executives will see the benefit in having an LMS administrator. Certainly that discussion is ongoing at the moment. Um, in the interim, because we have the skills, we're the ones doing the work. Um, and I think a lot of people, certainly in yesterday's presentation, resonated with that too. It might not be your official title, but you know that's your skill set, that's what you do. Um, the challenges that come along with that are not having the authority to make the decisions that you know would help improve the system. So, um, Chris, when, before I started, Chris could see the password reset was a huge issue. He didn't have any authority to do anything about it. Um, the people who had that level of access on the system weren't the ones answering the support queries. So they weren't really seeing that it was a huge issue. It's like, it's a password reset. You do two clicks and you're done. Um, yeah. you, you know, they really trivialized that issue, didn't they? Um, they, they, they did. The amount of times before you arrived, Lindy, there was there was probably two or three times when we had an official, you know, escalation. Like I, I tried to officially get something done through the process, and it just it just got lost in the, uh, you know, escalation. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, yes, yeah, Shane, I I remember that lesson as well. We, unfortunately, it's very easy to give responsibility. It can be a lot harder to give authority because the political side of that can be quite problematic. Um, so at the moment, we sit with the responsibility, but none of the authority. And by the merciful heavens, I have um, a manager who has the authority and understands the responsibility. Um, so generally, if I say, look, we need to move in this direction with it, it's not a problem. Those kind of working relationships are invaluable. Mm. Um, yeah. And, you know, authority without any kind of responsibility over it can be quite reckless and problematic as well, Shane. So you need both in the same person. It really does help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, fuel, or fuels the ones you already have, Shane. <laughs> um, so at the moment, we're lucky. Uh, the skill sets within our educators are they're gradually building up the confidence. The standardisation means they don't have to do outside their comfort zone so much. So that's improving things bit by bit. 
and I'm aware we're kind of up to time, so I, I'm quite happy to keep talking, but if people have got questions, by all means, throw them in, happy to answer. Or comments, comments are good. Thanks for coming, guys. It's a pleasure to have you in here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey guys, I'll quickly jump in and just uh, say thank you on behalf of the whole IME team. Thank you for giving up your time um, again for the second session and um, really appreciate it and it's been a really great presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us. Hope it helps. Um, I'm going to clear out. See you guys later. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.